Hello friends, welcome to King's Crops and today we will have a very interesting discussion on clinical embryology of the eye. Now this is going to be a complete course. I'll start from scratch right from the general embryology ending up with the ocular embryology and then we will have even more further details on each and every part of the eye how it develops as subsequent lectures. So this course itself is going to be a, a series of lectures and this is going to be the first part of this lecture where we will discuss about the general embryology and the basic ocular embryology, right? Uh, before I delve into the topic, I just want to make sure that this video series is going to be a, a, a video companion to my self-published book on the same uh, concept, Clinical Embryology of the Eye. You can download this book for free. Uh, the link for the download is given in the description box of the video on YouTube. Okay, so please make sure that you download this PDF, put it on your computers or on your phones and make sure that you read through the PDF after watching this lecture. So let's start things with the general embryology. So we'll first kickstart with the general embryology and then we will switch on to the basic ocular embryology, the derivatives of the eye and we will end with genetics in the eye development. Okay, now <clears throat> what we know is that there are three important components or three layers as far as embryology is concerned which anybody knows there is an ectoderm there is endoderm there is a middle mesoderm now ectoderm endoderm and mesoderm are the three germinal layers and of which only ectoderm and mesoderm will take part in the development of the eye endoderm does not have any contribution to ocular development very very important point to understand the ectoderm gives rise to surface ectoderm, neuroectoderm and neural crest cells. We will discuss all the details later, but just now know that there are three components of ectoderm, surface, neuro and neural crest cells. The neural crest cells and the mesoderm together, they are called as a mesenchyme. They are called as a mesenchyme. So surface ectoderm, neuroectoderm and mesenchyme comprising neural crest cells and mesoderm will contribute to eye development, okay? And just know that it's going to be the mesenchyme which is going to give a variety of derivatives as far as eye is concerned. So more than the surface ectoderm and the neuroectoderm, it is going to be our neural crest cells and the mesoderm together, what we call as a mesenchyme contributing to ocular development. Just have that in mind. So with this basic understanding or idea, with this uh, priming, let us jumpstart into the embryology proper. Okay. Now, what are the events that are happening here? Very interestingly, we'll start from scratch. We'll start from fertilization. So how does the zygote is being formed and how blastocyst is formed and how the bilaminar discs are formed, how the trilaminar discs are formed and how neural tube is formed. These are the events we will discuss in the general embryology part of this lecture. Okay. Now fertilization, as we all know here, we have the sperm. The sperm has to travel all the way from, you know, all the way through the cervical canal to the fallopian tube. And here you have the ovum, which is being delivered by the ovary. The job of the sperm is to fuse with the ovum to form the end product of fertilization, that is zygote. Now, how does zygote is being formed? In this picture, you can see that uh, this is going to be the ovum. Now the ovum is going to have a central part which consists of the genetic material of the ovum. This green circle is called as zona pellucida, surrounding which it has another protective layer called as corona radiata. Now multiple sperms will come and start attacking this corona radiata and only one sperm gets the success or gets the privilege of fusing with, uh, with the ovum. So it penetrates through this ovum. What happens then, there is going to be a second meiotic division which is going to get completed. Now the details of the mitosis and meiosis is not required right now, but just understand that the process of separation or the process of fertilization starts 
even when the sperm starts to penetrate it's like a magic that's happening there so what happens once a sperm gets entry into the ovum both are going to fuse both the both the female component and the male sperm are going to fuse with each other they're going to form female pronucleus and the male pronucleus now this is called as the oodid again these two pronuclei are going to fuse to form so called cleavage spindle this structure this cleavage spindle now has 2n number of chromosomes it's a diploid structure so from from the haploid ovum and the haploid sperm we get a diploid product that is a zygote which is nothing but the product of fertilization so far clear okay now this zygote which is a a, a diploid structure okay this is going to split this is going to undergo cleavage which is a process by which two cells are being formed and from these two cells four cells are being formed and there's going to multiply even more eventually forming the 16 cell stage and what they call as the morula morula means mulberry it's a fruit as you can see here so this looks like a you know like a cluster of grapes or a cluster of mulberry uh, fruits now this is called as the morulation or morula formation so from the zygote we have the formation of morula next what happens this mass of cells in the morula are going to differentiate themselves into an inner cell mass called as embryoblast and outer cell mass called as the trophoblast so you have differentiation of inner cell mass embryoblast and outer cell mass trophoblast the zona pellucida or the protective covering still persists now what happens this zona pellucida is going to give away or is going to lose by itself thereby exposing the trophoblast now this embryoblast cells are going to get even more compacted or even more condensed they're going to go to one pole of this uh, of this zygote thereby it is going to leave a fluid filled cavity called blastocele now this structure is called as the blastocyst this blastocyst is going to form these multiple projections called villi and now this blastocyst is ready to go and get implanted into the uterine cavity as you can see to summarize we have this is the ovary releasing the ovum the ovum getting fertilized by the sperm forming the cleavage the two cell stage four cell stage multiplying into the morula then they are going to form the blastocyst and blastocyst is implanted in the endometrium through the villi now this is what you have to know as far as implantation of blastocyst is concerned now this is going to be the blastocyst now what happens these cells or the embryoblast cells in this zygote or in this blastocyst that's how we can call it now are going to rearrange themselves and forms two important discs two important layers of cells the upper called as the epiblast the lower called as the hypoblast so when they arrange themselves as two discs now we have two separate fluid filled cavities one is the amniotic cavity superiorly and the yolk sac cavity inferiorly now the more important more relevant is the formation of trilamina disc so we saw a bilamina disc that is the epiblast and hypoblast now let's see how these two discs become three discs now this structure what i just discussed previously it's it's more of like a ball it's like a ball or it's like a melon now i'm just going to cut it open i'm going to expose this area here now this is a three dimensional structure of the of the of the bilamina disc so you have an epiblast just green in color you have the hypoblast which is yellow in color the epiblast and hypoblast are going to fuse or going to be at close approximation at one end it is called as a prochordal plate okay now what happens after some time there is going to be formation of a thickening at this area of the epiblast there is going to be a thickening at this area so there is going to be a straight line and there is going to be a small circular knob the straight line is called as a primitive streak and the circular uh, thickening is called as a primitive node now what happens the cells in the primitive streak are going to die or they're going to get degenerated thereby it leaves a groove called as the primitive groove 
and this area is called as the primitive pit so now you have primitive groove and primitive pit it is like a groove it's like a shallow area where there is nothing is there inside so what happens there now the cells from the epiblast are going to go down into this they're going to jump or they're going to migrate into this primitive streak as a result of which this like this like a tunnel through which the cells gain entry they come to the hyperblast and they're going to fill this hyperblast and now i'm going to call this hyperblast as endoderm and this epiblast as ectoderm so we have ectoderm and endoderm now how endoderm is formed the cells are going to come from the periphery of this epiblast going to travel through this converting this hyperblast into an endoderm now what happens after endoderm is being formed still more cells are going to come inside and now they are going to get sandwiched between the ectoderm and the endoderm as the middle layer mesoderm and this is how three germinal layers are being formed and the process of formation of these three layers are called as gastrulation that is an important point to consider so gastrulation is the process by which three discs or three layers are formed and this happens in the third week of gestational age third week is the time when gastrulation happens when does the two layers are formed or the epiblast and hyperblast are formed they are formed in the second week so easy to remember two discs or two layers at second week three discs at the third week and now to add more details to this picture the procaudal plate will become the future mouth so when this area is going to become the future mouth which means this is going to be the head end or it's going to be the cranial end of the future embryo okay now i'm going to look at the epiblast uh, sorry uh, i look at the ectoderm from a superficial point of view now this is a superior view of the ectoderm this green is the ectoderm now we don't call this as epiblast anymore this is an ectoderm now what happens more cells are going to travel therefore this becomes like a slipper this this looks like a slipper so there is more space or there is an enlarged cranial or cephalic end that is one thing and not just that what happens some cells are going to go through the primitive streak again and they're going to form a process called as a notochord process very very important structure now this notochord process is going to be like a like a shallow tunnel okay it is going to get sandwiched between the ectoderm and the endoderm and and the at the area where notochord is there you will not see any mesoderm so you can see mesoderm here but there is no mesoderm at this area because notochord is there this notochord process is going to be a very important structure in the formation of neural tube let us see how now in this picture again i have shown the ectoderm mesoderm and the endoderm and you have the notochordal process it's there later what happens the notochord process or like it's like it's going to be like a tube and now it's going to lose its canalization there is no more hollowness there then it becomes a definitive notochord so now there is no no uh, space or no lumen there so now this notochord has become a definitive notochord now what happens that this definitive notochord is going to give some signals to the ectoderm especially at the upper end just below the procaudal plate it is going to cause thickening of the ectoderm there is going to be a thickening so this is this is a superficial this is a superior view of the ectoderm okay this is a superior view and i am able to see this is a thickening thickened area of the uh, ectoderm this thickened area is called as the neural plate okay now this is the thickening called as a neural plate the the edges of this neural plate is called as the neural fold they become thickened as well and now what happens there is going to be formation of a central depression or a central groove what you call as a neural groove so as you can see the neural groove is being formed here later what happens this neural fold is going to fold itself to form a neural tube just know now now i'm going to take a cut section of this area i'm going to look through like this so this is going to be the cut section area as i just mentioned this is going to be a thickening of the ectoderm called as a neural plate now we call this neural plate as a neuroectoderm be very clear in it 
and now we call the other part of the ectoderm as a surface ectoderm so neuroectoderm is that area of the ectoderm which becomes the neural plate the other part of the ectoderm we called as a surface ectoderm so far clear okay now this is going to be a central depression what we call as a neural groove there is going to be a central depression of this neural plate what we call as a neural groove now this neural groove is going to still go down down into the mesoderm and it is going to get cut off at this area so this v gets pinched into an o now this is what you call as a neural tube have you seen this purple colored now these purple colored area they are specialized cells called as a neural crest cells they are derived from the neuroectoderm itself so even at this time even before there's a formation of this neural groove neural fold you have these specialized cells called neural crest cells are being formed and the neural crest cells are also going to get pinched out they're going to form like a like a sickle shaped structure just above the neural tube okay later what happens the neural tube is formed completely and neural crest cells take the side positions of the neural tube like here and this is going to be the mesoderm what you call as a paraxial mesoderm or we call it as a somites and you have the notochord here and you have the endoderm here now this is a very very important structure to remember please don't forget this you have a surface ectoderm up the neural tube is here in the middle you have the neural crest cells on the side you have notochord down you have the paraxial mesoderm uh, or somites here and you have the endoderm here so this process or by which the neural tube is formed is called as the neurulation clear now to summarize uh, here we have the male and female gamete fusing to form the zygote forming the morula blastocyst implantation of blastocyst formation of epiblast and hypoblast that is a bilaminar germ disk at second week at second week and then you have the formation of the trilaminar disk that is the ectoderm endoderm mesoderm this is going to be the cross section of the embryo at 22 days as you can see of the surface ectoderm here the neural tube is very well formed this orange structures are the or the paraxial mesoderm you have the notochord down and this is the endoderm i hope it's very clear till now now i'm going to take neural tube itself and i'm going to look at it from front so this is going to be the superior view this is going to be the sorry this is the superior end or the upper end this is going to be the inferior end the progodal plate is here which means this is going to be the mouth this is going to be the tail end or the anus end now this neural tube has two pores you it has an anterior neuropore and it has a posterior neuropore both these pores will fuse will close to form this into a proper tube when these neuropores are going to get opened up they are going to cause congenital anomalies like meningocele and anencephaly depending upon which neuropore will not close now now that's a discussion for another time but just now know that the neural tube is going to form three vesicles or three bulgings these are called as primary vesicles these are called as primary vesicles the primary vesicles are prosencephalon mesencephalon and rhombencephalon and this is going to be the spinal cord now prosencephalon is going to split again into telencephalon and diencephalon the midbrain which is being formed from the mesencephalon remains as such the rhombencephalon is going to split again into metencephalon and myelencephalon so these are called as a secondary vesicles so the primary vesicle prosencephalon gives telencephalon and diencephalon imagine diencephalon means imagine diana that we have princess diana here and we have telescopes focusing on diana okay just for for remembering so the image is we have diencephalon below the telencephalon above the telencephalon is the larger structure diencephalon is a smaller structure this prosencephalon is going to form the future forebrain mesencephalon is going to remain as such is going to form the midbrain metencephalon myelencephalon are going to form the hindbrain so far clear okay now our hero is going to be diencephalon because only from diencephalon the optic 
nerves develop to be more precise is going to be the optic stalk optic vesicle so the development of eye is going to buds off is is going to start off from the diencephalon so we'll see how the eyes are being formed from diencephalon in this next section on ocular embryology so we will discuss about the formation of optic cup lens vesicle and how the eyes are being uh, or how the the various parts of the eyes are being derived from the three layers what we saw so we will have uh, you can take a short break now if you want okay and now we'll quickly jump to the most important concept this it is going to be in day 22 on day 22 where the first event in eye development occurs what is the first event in eye development it is the it's the time when the optic primordium appears in the neural fold this is going to neural fold you can just remember so even before the neural tube forms the eyes are being starting to develop there's going to be this this kind of like a like a like a mark left okay some kind of genetic expression is also happening there so this optic primordium appears in the neural fold is the very first event in eye development just know that now this is going to be a four week embryo okay this is the picture of this embryo as you can see now the neural tube is formed the neural tube has gone for a gone for this bending part of it you have an optic vesicle there which is going to form the ear and you have the optic vesicle it's going to form the eye now I'm going to take a cross section at this area and I'm going to put it I'm going to look it from front that is going to be my orientation now you have this structure now you have the outer surface ectoderm the inner neuroectoderm forming neural tube so far clear the surface ectoderm is blue in color this green color is going to be the wall of the forebrain or the neural tube so neuroectoderm forming neural tube becoming the forebrain and this is going to be the wall of forebrain to be more precise this area is going to be the diencephalon now what happens there is going to be a small a depression at this area what he called as an optic groove or an optic sulcus very very important structure optic groove or optic sulcus now what happens this optic groove or optic sulcus is going to still go further okay it's going to extend out like an arm so it's going to form this optic stalk optic stalk and it's going to form a bulging at the end it's called as an optic vesicle let's zoom in this is going to be the wall of the forebrain and this is going to be the optic stalk and forming this bulging called as optic vesicle. Now I just see this, this is going to approach the surface ectoderm. Now let's see the chemistry between this optic vesicle and the surface ectoderm here. So the vesicle is approaching the surface ectoderm. As it approaches surface ectoderm, what happens? This area of surface ectoderm becomes thickened to form the lens placode. Okay. Now what happens later, there is going to be a small depression in this vesicle as well as in the lens pit. So both are going towards. So what you can expect now is there's going to be an invagination of this optic vesicle and you can see this lens placode also goes inside forming a lens pit. Slowly what happens, this optic vesicle is going to become like a cup. It is going to engulf this part of this lens pit as a result of which this part is going to get cut off forming this so-called lens vesicle. The surface ectoderm comes back to normal. So now you have a part of the surface ectoderm, the thickened lens placode has become a lens vesicle gets engulfed within the optic cup. So this is the optic stalk, this is the optic cup, this is the lens vesicle. Remember these three important structures. Now looking from front, you have the forebrain. Okay, you have this the cavity of the forebrain. You have the optic stalk, the optic cup and the lens vesicle here. The optic cup looks like a cup, but this is how actually it looks. Now the optic cup is going to have central depression and not just that it, it has a inferior area of uh, shallowness or there's going to be a fissure there's going to be a deficiency at the inferior end and that is called as choroidal fissure or an optic fissure i'm going to take a cross section at this optic stalk i'm going to expose it here looking from front you can see that inferior there is a deficiency 
that deficient area is called as a choroidal fissure okay and through this fissure is where the hyaluronic artery and the hyaluronic vein are going to pass through now on taking a cross section you can also appreciate that there are two layers of optic stalk you have an inner layer and you have an outer layer now what i'll do is i'll take a cut section through this area through the optic cup therefore i'm going to look it from sideways this is how it looks now you can see there's a inferior deficiency this inferior deficiency is called as the choroidal fissure you have the hyaluronic artery passing through this you have the lens vesicle here you have the inner wall and the outer wall of the optic cup now this optic cup is going to form the retina in future so you have the outer wall of the optic cup you have the inner wall of the optic cup okay this outer wall of optic cup is going to form the retinal pigmentary epithelium the inner wall of optic cup is going to form the neurosensory retina okay just know that for now now this is how the actual development happens in real time now this is going to be the embryo as you can see this is the neural tube which is attain its flexures what you call as the flexures or convolutions or bending so you can see this neural tube has bent and you can see the formation of this optic vesicle okay what happens later this optic vesicle becomes an optic cup you can see this deficiency here that is the choroidal fissure and this choroidal fissure will eventually fuse this choroidal fissure will eventually fuse note that so when it fuses it fuses at seventh week you can see this is going to be the optic vesicle forming the optic cup it has this choroidal fissure you can see the choroidal fissure here this fissure is going to close at seventh week very very important point please to remember it's seventh week the choroidal fissure closes and what if it will not close when there is no closure of choroidal fissure and that is when you have the very important clinical implication called as coloboma which we will discuss in the next part of this series of lectures So this is a table given in American Academy of Ophthalmology book. It is a big list is given here. But importantly, remember only this: twenty-two days is where the first event in eye development occurs. That is when the optic primordium appears. Okay. Remember the another one: closure of embryonic fissure begins at seven weeks. Day twenty-two, seven weeks. Remember these two. And now. we have seen how the optic uh, cup has formed and how the lens vesicle has gone inside now this is going to be the neural tube but we have forgotten one important player in this entire picture there is a neural crest cells so we saw the neural crest cells along with mesoderm called as a mesenchyme contributing to the major extent of the eye development and let us not forget them now this is going to be this neural crest cells are going to be like this migrating population they're going to migrate all the way very very important and they contribute to the formation of the eye to a very great extent now these green structures are going to be the migrating neural crest cells you can also see some mesoderm also getting migrated along with the neural crest cells now this population is called as the mesenchyme mesenchyme now to summarize the quick overview of the every picture happening here you have the the neural ectoderm okay this is the optic stalk forming the optic vesicle don't forget our migrating population the neural crest cells and the mesodermal cells that is going to be the lens placot and you can see this lens placot going inside as a lens vesicle the optic cup is formed from optic vesicle you can see the neural crest derived mesenchyme here you can see the choroidal fissure here as well you can see the inferior deficiency through which the hyaluronic vessels are also coming still further developments happen here as you can see the optic cup is even more formed well and you can see the starting to formation of the future retina this is going to be the future rpe which is the outer part of the cup forms the future rpe this future rp is the outer part of the cup the future neural retina is the inner part of the optic cup the inner part of it okay and the space between them is called as a sub retinal space which is a space between the neurosensory retina and the retinal pigmentary epithelium 
you can also appreciate the future corneal epithelium which is being formed from the surface ectoderm this is the lens vesicles forming the primary lens fibers eventually forming lens and as the embryo grows into week 7 into week 8 the eyes are being formed properly so now just look this is going to be the hyoid artery which is going to supply this lens slowly starting to regress very important okay so as of now just know that it's going to be formation of the eyes are going to get completed by week 8 or so so far so good okay now let us come to the more important practical understanding of the development of eye now we i just mentioned that there are going to be three important contributors to the development of the eye one is going to be the surface ectoderm second is going to be the neuroectoderm and third is going to be the mesenchyme this mesenchyme is nothing but neural crystals with the mesoderm now we will see how each parent or how surface ectoderm gives rise to multiple layers of the eye how neuroectoderm gives rise to multiple layers of the eye one by one now to put it in the simplest way possible just read through this almost all structures of the eyeball are derived from neural crest cells in other words we'll keep this as mesenchyme okay let's not confuse almost all structures of eyeball are derived from neural crest cells or mesenchyme because mesoderm contributes only to a very very limited extent it is going to be the neural crest cells which is going to be a part of the mesenchyme is going to give a major contribution to the development of the eye so to read again almost all structures of the eyeball are derived from neural crest cells except 10 structures five structures from neuroectoderm and five structures from surface ectoderm will not be derived from neural crest cells okay so what are the five structures from neuroectoderm retina that is including all parts both neurosensory retina both retinal pigmentary epithelium optic nerve epithelium of iris epithelium of ciliary body and smooth muscles of iris sphincter pupillae and dilator pupillae these are the five structures arising from neuroectoderm what are the five structures which are derived from the surface ectoderm the lens the epithelium of conjunctiva the epithelium of cornea epithelium of skin and eyelids and the glands namely lacrimal gland as well as the glands of the eyelid so remember this in a nutshell this is going to be the most important slide you have to remember for this entire presentation even if you forget everything told just remember this remember the five structures from neuroectoderm remember the five structures from surface ectoderm the rest are from neural crest cells you are good to go in any examination in any practicals trust me now we'll have a more detailed understanding now this green is going to be the neuroectoderm okay this is the neural tube derived from the neuroectoderm the diencephalon the telencephalon the diencephalon giving rise to optic stalk forming the optic cup the optic cup becoming the retina and it forms the epithelium of the ciliary body as well the epithelium of iris as well the muscles of iris also is here and this is going to be the surface ectoderm which is given its contribution as the lens so remember this green now the green is going to be the neuroectoderm forming all these structures next come to the blue this blue is going to be the surface ectoderm the surface ectoderm after giving lens it's also a part of surface ectoderm there's going to be epithelium of cornea not the entire cornea epithelium of cornea epithelium of lids epithelium of conjunctiva and epithelium of the nasolacrimal duct also lacrimal gland is also formed from the surface ectoderm and the important other adnexal features are the eyelash follicles meibomian glands glands of zeez and mol these are the eye, uh, eyelid glands as well the glands of cross and wolfri in the conjunctival glands so the blue is over surface ectoderm is over now I've come to this look at how dense contributions this purple is giving this purple is the neural crest cells okay so you can see the purple neural crest cells forming the optic nerve sheath forming choroid sclera and tenons forming the ciliary muscles in the ciliary body also forming the stroma 
the stroma of the iris, stroma of the ciliary body, stroma of the cornea, trabecular meshwork, connective tissues of fats and lids, orbit bones and adipose tissues and other connective tissues within the orbit. Such a high contribution is given from the neural crest cells. Now look at this red. Red is very, very few, very, very minor contributions, extraocular muscles. This is nothing but from the mesoderm. The mesoderm giving extraocular muscles. The temporal part of sclera is from the mesoderm and skeletal muscles of eyelids, namely orbicularis oculi and levator palpebris superioris are also from the mesoderm. Okay, so far it's very clear, I think. Now let us go back again. Neuroectoderm, retinal pigmentary epithelium, neurosense retina, together is what forms as the retina, the neuroglia of the optic nerve, the epithelium of ciliary body in iris, the smooth muscles of iris, secondary vitreous. For those who want to know more, just know that secondary vitreous is from neuroectoderm. Just know that. We'll discuss about the details in the subsequent lectures where I discuss about each and every layer of the eye and its development. The surface ectoderm and its derivatives. Lens. You saw the secondary vitreous derived from the neuroectoderm. Now surface ectoderm is giving primary and tertiary vitreous. So there are three types of vitreous in the vitreous development. You have primary, secondary and tertiary. Primary and tertiary are from the surface ectoderm. The secondary is from the neuroectoderm. Okay. And you can see the corneal epithelium from surface ectoderm. The epithelium of lids, conjunctiva, nasolacrimal duct, we just saw all these things now. Eyelash follicles, meibomian gland, glands of Wiesen Moll, glands of Cross and Wolfring, all from surface ectoderm. The neural crest cells giving stroma of the cornea, iris, ciliary body, all the stroma. When you think of stroma, think of neural crest cells. The corneal endothelium is also from neural crest cells. Only corneal epithelium is from the, yes, recall, from the surface ectoderm. Trabecular meshwork, ciliary muscle, the sheets of optic nerve, the adipose tissues of the eyelids, orbit bone adipose tissues, the melanocytes, very, very important. All the melanocytes are from neural crest cells. Derivatives of mesoderm, very, very few. In fact, the least contributions from mesoderm, the vascular endothelium, the temporal portion of sclera, the extraocular muscles and skeletal muscles of eyelids are also from the mesoderm. Okay, this is the big, big picture. Just take a photograph or a screenshot of this picture and take a screenshot of the slide which is all the most important that all from neural crest cells except five and five, take a photo of that also. Very, very important, my dear friends. See, this is the entire picture I've drawn with color coding. Take a moment to pause and study this diagram. Again, reproduce this diagram in your exams. That is enough, you're good to go. This is going to be a short video, a short animation of the entire process. Just watch it now. I won't talk anything. Just observe what's happening. And ta-da, the entire eyeball is formed like a magic. So, so far we have discussed about the general embryology, the ocular embryology covering only the basic ocular embryology and the derivatives of the eye from where each part of the eye is being derived from. Now let us have a very quick, quick, short description of the genetics of the eye as far as development is concerned. Just remember these two genes. There are multiple genes which can cause anomalies in the eye, but the most important are these two, PAX6 or paired box 6, SHH, sonic hedgehog. PAX6 is called as the master gene. It's called as the master gene. It is the switch for eye development, the most important gene. If there is one gene which you have to remember for eye development, it is PAX6. The second is a sonic hedgehog gene. 
I'll tell about the importance in the next slide. Now this is the, now this looks like a very complicated picture. Just know that's very easy. Just know this, this is gonna be uh, what we studied previously in general embryology, the formation of neural plate, the neural groove, the primitive node, primitive streak, the neural folds are being formed, okay? Now just understand this. This is going to be the drawing of the same picture here. Just see this, just observe this, nothing more, nothing less. Just see this, this red is pack six. This orange is the sonic hedgehog, which means these genes are expressed even before the formation of neural tube. That's what I mentioned. The very first event in the ocular development is formation of the optic primordium in the neural fold. That is in day 22, I said. So the genes are expressed even way before things are happening. Okay, which is very essential because only if PAX6 is expressed, the eyeball develops. Only if sonic hedgehog is expressed, the eye field is split into two. Only then you will have two eyeballs. Okay, so the sonic hedgehog is essential for the division of the eye field into two separate eye globes. So what happens if the sonic hedgehog gene is going to be mutated or lost or affected? It is going to form holoprosen cephaly where there's going to be a single eye, a single central eye called as a cyclopean eye. This is called as a synophthalmia, synophthalmia. Okay, so you have a single central cyclops eye, you have a proboscis here. What happens when PAC6 is getting affected? Now PAC6 is called as a master gene, also called as a switch for eye development. If it is mutated, it will form coloboma, microphthalmia. Coloboma, we will discuss in the next lecture. Microphthalmia means a small eyeball. So yes, the next lecture is gonna be on coloboma. So we will end our discussion here for this. This is gonna be part one of this entire series of lectures. The next lecture will be on coloboma. Uh, we'll discuss about the clinical features, the pathophysiology, how it forms, and how to treat, so on and so forth. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much for uh, for listening to this lecture. This is my uh, intense hard work in preparing the diagrams. So thanks a lot. I hope it was useful for you. Just to end with, I wanna say, this is going to be the link where I upload more content, okay? So this is going to be my Facebook page called as the King's Crocs. So here I upload uh, not just uh, the videos, whatever I post, this is one of my videos, not just that, I will post more PDFs, more uh, illustrated text notes for you guys to enrich and for you guys to learn. So that ends with the entire lecture. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks a lot. Cheers.